Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, Word for the Moment video blog. I um, have been looking forward to doing this blog. Had some things happen prophetically that I want to share with you that I hope will be an encouragement to you, uh, affirmation to many. And uh, But before I get into the blog, I just want to take this brief opportunity and just thank those of you that help us. You know, I don't have much of an opportunity at a to share with people, you know, we don't have a church and this is really my only means of contact with those that follow our ministry. And I just want to thank you for helping us and supporting us and, and uh, just for being so loyal. I, I thank you not only for the financial support you give us so that we can do what we do, but also the emails. I read them all. In fact, I'm going to, t I'm going to do a, a, a message today that is birthed out of some of the questions that have been asked through the emails. And so I want to encourage you to continue sending the emails. It gives me a pulse of where you are and uh, what I can do to help make things more clear and even answer questions in the, in the process of doing the various blogs. But I want to thank you. We're um, hoping to do another project where we upgrade our video ability. Uh, we want to buy another camera. It's about a seven, $8,000 investment where we uh, purchase another camera to give different angles, which would help just with the quality of what we do, and especially help when I do interviews with other people. A little odd, a little difficult to do uh, really good camera shots with just one camera when you're, when you're interviewing two people or got two people in the scene. And so if anyone would like to help us with that, we would be grateful. Now, on to my video blog. Uh, I had something kind of interesting happen this morning as I have been thinking over the last couple of days what it was that I wanted to share in, in the blog. There's so many things, so many things that are brewing right now. I, I've had some stuff that I want to talk about in the way of warfare and, and just the, the different phase of spiritual war that we're in. It's not a warfare like we've been accustomed to. It's a warfare where we're taking ground. It's a crossing over the Jordan kind of warfare anointing, not a warfare where you're trying to keep your sanity and keep, your, keep yourself alive. You know, that's what most of us have just been trying to fight to keep ourselves alive. No, this, this warfare is we're alive and well, and now we're, we're cutting heads. We're about to take some ground. And I want to talk about that, but I don't have time on this one. But, but uh, that was kind of what I wanted to go into. But I had a dream this morning when I was thinking about uh, my blog. And what was really so interesting was in my dream, I did the blog. <laughs> I woke up from the, from the dream thinking, wow, if Caleb could have filmed that blog in my dream, that would have been a really good blog. But I'm going to do my best to try to emulate it with you and share with you what was in my dream. So I know it's from the Lord. I, I obviously will not be able to go into nearly as much depth in this little blog that I will, will eventually go into over the course of the next month. I'll probably end up doing a webinar. But I wanted to do this by way of introduction of what the Lord began to talk to me about in the dream. And it involves sonship. I've been doing some teaching, you know, I've, I've spoken a few times and one of the messages the Lord has given to me to emphasize is the truth about the spirit of adoption. The word huiothesia, which is the, the placing of a mature son. And I've said this often, you, you don't receive the spirit of adoption to become a son. You receive the spirit of adoption because you are a son. Very important distinction. And one of the things the spirit of, of adoption is doing is moving us into maturity, it is bringing us to the place where we can be placed into our position to receive our inheritance. It's a growth, it's a maturity, going from being an infant into a man. And so one of the questions that, that I have received from several of you over the course of the last couple of weeks is, some practicalities. What are some practical applications of that? And I think that's a great question. How do we practically integrate that truth into our life? And what can we do uh, in our lives that make us, of course, develop into a more mature son? And of course, they're the obvious things. I'll just touch on a few of those before I get into my dream. But obviously, becoming men and women of prayer. One thing you need to understand, one of the main things you need to understand, you know, going to church 
which I advocate, of course. I think it's good to be part of a fellowship. But going to church on Sunday morning and maybe prayer meeting on Wednesday night is a minuscule part of being a son of God. It is just a minute part. You, you, you know, you don't, a son doesn't just go to church. A son is what you are. You're a son of God, a son of the living God, 24-7. Jesus Christ, when he walked the earth, was this, the manifestation of the Son of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Every thought, every breath, every action, every step, every turn that he did was under the orchestration and leadership of his Father, the Holy Spirit. And that, that is true for us. You need to understand that. We are led by the Spirit. The mature huyo sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. And we wake up with God on our hearts. We wake up quoting the Scriptures. We pray without ceasing. We, we, we're constantly doing things that are God-related. Even if you deliver mail or work for UPS or work in a bank or a homemaker, God is always at the forefront of your mind because you're a son of God. And I, I've said this often, and you need to understand, sonship has nothing to do with gender. Women are sons of God because it's the word becoming flesh. And I won't take time to develop that. So I want to make sure, though, everyone understands that, that, that a woman is a son of God because they are the, the word of God manifested in flesh. And so we are sons continuously. And so how do we develop that? How do we mature that? And you might say prayer, of course prayer. The Word of God, of course the Word of God. All those things. But in my dream last night, I had the most interesting thing where I watched myself sitting here doing the blog. And the Lord gave me a little bit of a strategy for teaching what it is to become a mature son of God. A little bit of a strategy of how we as an individual can cultivate the culture of our life in such a way that we end up being more mature and follow the progression of the Spirit until we come to a place where He can place His anointing, His sonship on us, the maturity of sonship. And the two scriptures that I was given, of course, Romans chapter 8, verses 19 and 22, which talks about the fact that all of creation is groaning, waiting for the revealing of the Huios of God. That's a very important word. You know, when, when if you don't understand the fact that the creation is groaning, waiting for the mature sons of God, sons that have been placed into their inheritance. That's the most important thing. You know, a person can be born again. You can go out and have an evangelistic crusade. And 10,000 people can be saved. And they are, they're the sons of God. But those are technons. Those are babies. They're not yet mature enough to be able to handle their inheritance. All of creation is not groaning for evangelism. All of creation is groaning, waiting for the, rev the revelation, the revealing of the mature sons of God that have been subject to the spirit of adoption. That's what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Well, let me just read 22 while I'm at it. For we know that the whole creation groans. The whole creation, everything groans. Why? Because the remedy, the remedy for this dark age is the revealing of the sons of the Holy Spirit through the revelation of the sons of God. That is the remedy, the answer, the antidote to all the social ills out there, of all the trauma, of all the darkness that exists in the earth. The Holy Spirit is the answer, and He's going to reveal that answer through the mature sons of God. So, for we know that the whole of creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves having the first fruits. I don't want just first fruits. I want fullness, the mature son of God. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. All of creation is waiting for us to become what God has ordained for us to be. And in my dream last night, I was teaching as I am now. And the Lord showed me that what He has done in history is the same progression that an individual will take in his journey to become a mature son. 
what we saw, and this is just going to be an abbreviated teaching, it has to be for the sake of time, but what we saw was the great reformation, the world-changing reformation where we saw the unveiling, the restoration to the, to the church of the, that the just shall live by faith. Make no mistake about it, however, God always had a remnant on the earth. God has never been without a remnant of His people on planet earth that walked in the fullness of this gospel, always. They may have been hidden away somewhere, but because of the age in which we, the people live, the dark ages and the spiritual organization that ruled, quote unquote, Christendom at that time was so oppressive and offensive and, uh, and idolatrous that the real true Christians were hidden away in caves and catacombs. But then there was a breakthrough. There was a breakthrough of a truth. God said, I will restore. I will restore, saith the Lord. And he restored the just shall live by faith. And you have this whole movement that changed the face of Christianity. And I'm going to have to move quickly now for, for the sake of time. Then you have another outpouring. The days of John Wesley where the truth was restored of sanctification by the washing of the water of the word. And all of Christianity was transformed again. Uh, our whole understanding of the Christian life, of what it meant to serve God, of how you serve God, a new light came upon the scriptures and the scriptures began to transform people and they became something more than what they were. And that, that true, those two truths existed up until the days of Azusa Street. Then we had another breakthrough revelation where you have Azusa Street, which is Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the restoration of the gifts of the Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Spirit, and all the different charismata, things that we learned from Kenneth Hagin, if you will. You know, that whole Pentecostal blessing that came on the day, uh, 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 that came at, at Azusa Street, the, the, uh, the outpouring of, of tongues and tongues interpretation and all these different things, which is a vital part of our Christian walk are all indicative of what we as individuals go through. That was my point. That was what I dreamed. We become a Christian, the just shall live by faith, and we live in the glory of that revelation for a season. And then the Lord pours His Spirit out upon us again as an individual, and He begins to say, now let's work on some issues. <laughs> you are being sanctified now by the washing of the water of the Word. And then we realize that we have to live a sanctified life. The scriptures begin to tell us the, the, the ways of our conduct. That's the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption, moving us from one phase of sonship into another phase of sonship where our character and our nature is refined by the washing of the water of the Word of God through revelation. And then we come to another as we have developed a, a life in that place. We come to another expression of outpouring as an individual, as an individual where the Holy Spirit comes upon us in a powerful way and gifts are activated inside of us. And maybe we begin to prophesy and maybe we begin to lay hands on the sick and they recover and all the various things that we see with the Pentecostal experience and we live in that phase for a while. And that's a, that's a season of maturity. And by the way, a season of great growth. Because once you start moving in the supernatural, you enter an entirely new arena of spiritual opposition. Now you have to remember, the enemy is trying his best to keep you from growing up. <laughs> what he ha what he, he, his only hope, all of creation is groaning, waiting for the revelation of the mature sons of God. So what's he trying to do? Keep that from happening. And once a person steps out and begins to operate in the supernatural, they begin to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, and they begin to see people getting set free, you go into a whole new arena of spiritual warfare over your life. But that is sometimes where the greatest growth comes from. That's where you learn how to survive. That's how you learn how to put on the whole armor of God. It's where you learn how to become mature. It's where you learn how to not be offended every time someone writes a bad blog about you or, or says something ugly to you or not under, doesn't understand your words or all the different things that happen when we begin to do that kind of ministry. The Lord allows that. Why? Because you're growing up because He's wanting to put a mantle on you that's going to change planet Earth. 
And so we go through this season, and that's probably one of the most difficult seasons. And just for the sake of time, let me quickly move on. Then we had another outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was the, the outpouring of what was called latter rain voice of healing, where there was an incredible demonstration of the supernatural. But one of the things that came out of that was truth. Truth. God not just sanctified our nature as he did with the washing of the water of the word in, this, in the second expression of outpouring I mentioned, but now he began to deal with things we believed that were not necessarily true, things that had been traditions of men rather than the true revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you were to look back over the last 50 years, we have had more correction of our doctrine, if I use the word doctrine, then in any season of church history, we're, we're believing more, more and more in alignment with the Word of God. The Spirit of truth is being poured out, guiding us into all truth. Now, why is that important? Because the Son of God is the Word manifested in flesh. I one time had this experience where I was praying and praying and just believing God to pour His, His anointing out on my life and, and to, to release gifts and all these different things. And I heard a voice say to me while I was praying, and just this towering voice, I am not going to anoint you. And there was silence for a moment. I was terrified. I was mortified. I am going to anoint my word in you. Oh, then I got it. You know, God's not going to anoint me He's going to anoint the revelation of His Word in me. So therefore, what I believe is paramount. Jesus Christ was the pure Logos revelation of the Word. And when the Spirit and the Word were integrated as one, it produced the mature Son of God. It produced the Son of God, God Himself, Emmanuel, God among us. And the same protocol, the same principle applies today. These progressions that we have seen in history, if you want to know how you can become a mature son of God, be a student of history. Watch what the Lord has done when he poured his spirit out in the Reformation and then again in the days of Wesley and again in the days of the early 20th century and again in the days of the latter rain movement. You'll find there your destiny. You'll find the journey that you yourself have been on bringing you to the place that now you're putting the revelation of the Word inside of you. You're eating the Word. We're, we're literally in Revelations chapter 10 where we eat the Word. And what you eat, you become. You don't have the Word. You don't read the Word. You, don't, you are the Word. What you devour, what you eat, Revelations 10, verses 8 through 11. You eat the opened book, which is the full and complete revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what a mature son of God will be, the revelation of that word, because the, the Spirit is about to be poured out. And just very quickly, in closing on this blog, I wish I had probably another hour, but, and I will do this in a better way in a much longer webinar in the future. But the other thing that I saw, of course, is the, is the fact that you can lay out on top of what I just described to you the Feast of Israel, the Feast of the Lord, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Those two are like progressions. We live in the Passover truth for a season. Then we move on into the Pentecostal truth, and there's so much to that because you have, but in Passover, you have, you have Passover, the, the blood. Then, of course, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then you have the Feast of First Fruits. And then, of course, you move on to Mount Sinai, the incredible, powerful experience of Mount Sinai, as it were, in the days of, of Israel under the leadership of Moses, which was fulfilled, of course, with the 120 when the Holy Spirit fell upon those 120 and occupied them. But you have the Pentecostal experience and all those things that go with it. And that brings us to tabernacles because the mature sons of God will walk in the fullness of the revelation of tabernacles. A mature son of God will cross over and begin to live the prophetic implications that are associated with the Feast of Tabernacles. I have a teaching 
a several part teaching that I did on the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the Feast of Glory. It's the Feast of His Presence. It is the Feast of the Open Book. It is the Feast of Full Restoration. There are so many things, but the Feast of Tabernacles is associated with the second coming of Christ. It is associated with a body of people that are called to be the mature sons of God whose life reflects all of the prophetic truth that is associated with the Feast of Tabernacles, which will take us then right into the millennium. And we'll continue to be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles even in the millennium when the Lord Jesus Christ comes from heaven and sets his throne up on the earth and rules planet earth for a thousand years with a perfect utopia. And who's going to rule and reign with him? His, his bride and his sons, which are the same group of people, the sons of God, will rule and reign. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 5. Worthy is the Lamb to take the book and break its seals, for thou wast slain and purchased for God with thine own blood men of every nation, tongue, tribe, and kingdom, and thou hast made them to be priests and kings before our God. That's what the sons will be. That's what we will do on planet Earth. And what we do in this life is preparation for what we will do in the age to come. And if there's one thing I can prophesy to you right now, there is an emphasis on mature sonship. There is an emphasis on becoming a huios of God, a mature son that God has recognized. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he gives him his signet ring. In some translations, this is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased to dwell. Lord, raise up your sons, I pray. Release upon us, release upon every person within the sound of my, my voice the spirit of adoption that will take us from where we are to where we need to be so that we can receive the full measure of our inheritance, our anointing, our gifting, our calling, so that you yourself, Lord, can occupy your people and do through your people what you did when you walked this earth in human form. Grant that, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.